Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for giving me some time today. I realize I'm probably one of maybe the only uh, non-technical academic in the room, but thanks for having me anyways. Uh, I wanted to begin today's talk by first off saying uh, indoor 3D is pretty amazing, and for a lot of the general public and users, uh, it's kind of like what I experienced uh, yesterday. So I arrived a couple days ago to Cape Town my first time, and uh, I was doing rock climbing on Table Mountain yesterday. And I did it in the morning, and little did I know, you know what I signed up for. So basically, we went to the top of Table Mountain, uh, we hiked just a little bit down, and we saw those little rats, the Destines. <laughs> and, um, that was interesting, it was cold, I was in a tank top and shorts. I'm like, I'm gonna be rock climbing, it's gonna be hot. So I was freezing, the wind was blowing, and um, Fast forward, so I'm in my gear for rock climbing, uh, and then my guide says, okay, Christian, just lean back on the rope. And I look over, and that just drops, like, what, 3,000 feet, 2,000 feet, uh, and it's, you know, the wind is blowing, and my heart starts beating. I'm thinking, what am I doing? This is crazy. Uh, like, every ounce of my being is saying, do not go back, do not go to the edge, do not trust the rope. And I had to psych myself out and just like breathe and you know look at my guide and just say, okay, he's a professional. You know, I paid for his time, I trust his services, he has no deaths so far, I can do this. And when I leaned back on the rope, I'm still shaking, it was crazy. Uh, I just I slowly went down the, the face of Cable Mountain and that was one of two drops of cliffs. I had to do the second had no rock at all and I was just in midair the wind was blowing me like nothing. So uh, that was amazing, I will never forget it. And with with indoor 3Ds and with indoor location in particular, a lot of our general public and users are feeling anxious. They are feeling that the government is now controlling uh, you know, what's going on all the time. The government is now aggregating all the user data and the government is now dictating you know, what we're buying and how we're buying and how much we're buying. But in fact, what we need to do for them is be their guides. What we need to do for them is allow them to trust us, to guide them down this new venture and to help them understand uh, the applicable uh, real ways that this can affect their life positively and get them through the next phase, the next journey uh, uh, the, the next millennium, really, of location and just daily life with uh, more accuracy, uh, more safety, and ultimately fun. That's that's the goal of all this. That's why we're all here, because all of your research and all of your hard academics and algorithms and signals and everything that drives regular people like me crazy, um, it's useful for, for an average person to go out in their daily life and be able to pop into a store buy a pair of soccer shoes for the kids, you know, go to the restaurant, get home in time for whatever meeting you have next, seamlessly. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So, uh, the focus on indoors. So, people spend about 80 to 90% of their time indoors, uh, about 70% of cellular calls, and about 80% of data connections originate from indoors. And this has probably changed just in the last year. Um, we see a lot of activity with uh, retail, with malls, also with the airports, uh, now with public transportation systems. And then uh, some ones that have been in the business for a while have been things like car parks, uh, convention halls, and uh, some new interests are campuses, stadiums, and casinos, those are really trending right now uh, in the marketplace. And uh, like George said earlier, a lot of what I do as a consultant is match all the hard work that you do to the business world. So I match the right solution with the right requirements for what they're looking for and manage the deployment of that solution. Business. Money, that's exactly uh, what, why we're here uh, in, in the big picture, uh, along with security. Uh, it's a 500 billion retail commerce, and it will be conducted on mobile phones by 2015. 
about 70% of all brands and purchase decisions are made in store. Um, if you think about going in for the holiday shopping, if you don't find what you're looking for, you're going to be frustrated and you're going to leave. So about 90% of shoppers say they have trouble finding things while shopping inside a store. Um, personally, I hate shopping. I try to do it online uh, if I have to at all. So I would probably be one of those users that would just leave the store if I couldn't find what I'm looking for. So that would be a loss of revenue for, for the retailer. 87% um, of retailers see value in using smartphones to drive traffic to the store compared with 65 last year. And again, I think these numbers have now augmented. Uh, consumers do not want to wait one business day to receive e-commerce. And speaking to that effect, Amazon, you know, one of the largest uh, online retailers uh, in the marketplace, has now introduced uh, virtually daily deliveries. So they're partnering with the U.S. Postal Service to even deliver on Sundays, which is traditionally just a closed business day uh, for food delivery services. Um, so they're really you know, reacting to the marketplace. Users do not want to wait. They want it now. They want to be always connected. And they don't want to answer uh, no. Uh, increasingly, looking to their mobiles for shopping, finding the store, the product, the deal, the direction, the price comparisons, etc. 79% of smartphone owners use them to help with shopping. 73% of shoppers with smartphones favor using them to handle simple tasks in stores, e.g. finding product, compared with 50% who favor interaction with an employee. Now, I, I'm actually one of these weird people that actually like talking with a human being. So it, it's kind of funny, like the kind of business I do, it's, I don't understand it. But I like talking to a person when I walk into a store. The only problem I have, seriously, is when I go into uh, a store for hardware, for example, you know, I'm always fixing something in my old house. Uh, I ask the employee, and they don't know what I'm talking about. They don't know what aisle the product is on. They don't know how much it costs. They don't know where I can find it if they're out of it. So that's the issue. If you don't have educated stores, uh, personnel uh, in, in the stores, you know, you're gonna, this number is gonna go, gonna go down. So it's just gonna be all automation and uh, indoor location. Uh, travel. So to improve customer service, uh, wayfinding inside terminals, passengers can plan their time inside an airport, get information on gates, shops, restaurants, and other services in a fun and interactive way. And key is monetization. Uh, if you target a layover passenger, for example, with offers to buy a product or service, let's say, you know, I need razors, so I pay for the conference, uh, this app can pop into your mobile, send me a notification, I can be in and out of you know, a store very quickly to make my connection. So this is the type of movement in the marketplace that I actually see more and more of today. So I want to speak about, speak about that just for a few minutes. Um, I had a uh, client, and the use case was the airport. This particular airport wanted a new rev revenue source uh, from the retailers inside the airport. Um, it was a, a pretty large you know, location. NDA is preventing me from saying anything more. Um, and they really wanted indoor location services for uh, their users, for the restaurants, for the parking, for the car rentals, uh, for a customer loyalty program. And this type of use case is actually what I'm getting pinged and asked about as a consultant works in the space more and more. And if you think about it, that ties nicely with indoor 3D. Uh, because if you have in accurate indoor location and then you have a real type of uh, visualized model of that, it's going to increase the, uh, the optimization and the revenue for this type of example. Now, uh, just going into it for a little bit, uh, with auto wayfinding features, they were uh, discussing geofencing, you know, basically building a virtual perimeter that, tri that triggers an alert when you pass through it. Uh, how many here are familiar with this type of technology? I'm just curious. Raise your hands. Oh, not that many. Three, four. Okay. So basically, the geofencing, uh, let's say this is the retail environment. Um, you could set up a, a virtual fence, and with your smartphone, if you walk into it, 
uh, you, you uh, trigger an alert, the systems talk to each other, they know where you are, they can send you like a push notification, um, welcoming you to the store, for example, and syncing you up with uh, internal store systems. Um, let's see, uh, oh, so my next slide is going to uh, talk about this a little bit more. Uh, basically, the there are two ways to do this. Uh, we're talking about Wi-Fi here, but there's also Bluetooth, and I'll get into that later. Uh, no, no additional infrastructure needed, more or less. Um, today's smartphones are equipped with several motion sensors that, that this technology works with. The you know, accelerometer, the gyroscope, the mag magnetometer, the altimeter, uh, they all work together hand in hand with the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to get this precise indoor location. Um, so accuracy, anytime you're on a conference call with any CEO or CTO with indoor location, accuracy is the first question not only do I pose to them, but I also play with them a bit, giving them different use cases and different scenarios. Because if you're not accurate, indoor loses all relevancy, at least in my world, in, in the business world. I mean, if I'm driving my car and I get a push notification for uh, I don't know, some type of service, uh, dry cleaning, and I'm, you know, hundreds of meters away from the first dry cleaning that's trying to get my business, it's irrelevant. Or if I'm driving my car, or I'm walking in the mall and I keep getting the same push notification to my mobile device for uh, a restaurant or something, uh, it's going to become annoying and I'm just going to forget about it. So accuracy with regard to uh, contextualization is key. <laughs> so with indoor location technologies, with this uh, particular example, <clears throat> we know that GPS uh, does not work indoors. Um, we know that uh, smartphones, like I said earlier, have the various uh, gyroscopes and sensors. Uh, so the solution really is to use these sensors, leverage them with a Wi-Fi signal or Bluetooth uh, to get this type of uh, solution in place. We have sensor one, sensor two, we have the indoor map that has to be created uh, either by the vendor or by the retailer, uh, or venue I should say. Uh, and then you have the uh, sensor fusion, you know, the particular uh, proprietary algorithms. You guys probably know more about than me. And then you get the user position. So I think you guys would be familiar with something like this. Um, again, speaking to the types of sensors that are in today's uh, smartphone, all of these you probably know. What's new is uh, Bluetooth. So right now, uh, Apple came out with uh, 4.0 uh, low energy. And that I am going to speak about um, in detail later. And the reason is, before Apple came out with this, we were depending on the regular Bluetooth, which, which uh, essentially drain the battery too quickly for your mobile device, okay? And we don't want that to happen because then your mobile device dies and all of this is pointless. Uh, in addition, the uh, Wi-Fi, the gyroscopes, the accelerometers, et cetera, compass altimeters, you know, for the X, Y, and Z, uh, all work together, uh, but you would need a lot of Wi-Fi or at least a very strong Wi-Fi network to get any indoor solution in the real world marketplace, uh, like Cisco is doing, among other companies, uh, to get a, a nice application that you can download with your smartphone. Um, even with uh, pretty well established Wi Fi networks, um, you know, I don't know the details, but from what I hear, there's still a lat latency issue. So, for example, if you Google uh, Barclays Stadium Brooklyn, they just you know, opened up a nice new stadium, fancy, all the bells and whistles, and they have a really cool app. Uh, the only problem is Cisco built the Wi-Fi network, sorry, um, and there's about 10 to 15 seconds of latency. So they're having issues and they're trying to work out the kinks and bugs to get this Wi-Fi working accurately for the positioning for, for the mobile app. And actually, I don't think they did a lot with the actual positioning <coughs> inside the app, because of this issue they're trying to work on. Uh, so revenue generation opportunities. 
this is where I get excited. The, or at least the people I work with do. Uh, basically, they're looking at uh, transaction fees, advertising, sponsorship, that's always been key in social media, and it's growing. Uh, third party vendors, e.g. hotels and services, they'll add on a percentage normally in any type of uh, application build out, deployment, and loyalty membership fees, we're finding that more common too. So these types of re uh, revenue generation <coughs> opportunities are just going to grow. Uh, traditional advertising is going wayside, and this type of uh, revenue optimization is just growing exponentially. If you look at budgets in in your average corporation, they're slashing you know the marketing budget, but they're increasing the mobile budget because the mobile guys and ladies are are, are making this happen. That they're enabling this to happen on on their systems. Um, I just wanted to touch on this really quickly. Currently. Uh, the MySpace in particular is fragmented. Uh, you have all of these different players in the ecosystem, but no one really works or plays well together unless I ask them to, for a project, for example. Uh, so with this type of fragmentation, uh, you have your indoor location providers like Cisco, Qualcomm, Google. You have your, and this, these are just examples. You know, there's tons more. Uh, you have the indoor map providers, for example, Point Inside, I411. Bing, Micello, you have the app developer, uh, developer that I like to use, uh, Actions Mobile, among others, there's tons. Uh, there's content providers, which is the example I've been speaking to, you know, the retailers. And then you have the indoor an analytics provider. And these guys are actually growing too. Uh, the more and more the companies uh, develop their mobile teams for a mobile strategy, uh, the more important analytics and metrics become. Uh, the fact that you now can track, you know, the most heavily walked through area in a store uh, with heat maps or with these type of analytics with the Bluetooth, you know, the, the more that they're going to want granular metrics, granular analytics for this type of work. So ID pins. Um, this is pretty exciting. So, uh, with the announcement of uh, Bluetooth Low Energy or 4.0, um, iBeacons has been trending for, God, the past two, three weeks. Um, I don't, there's not a day that goes by for almost a month now that I'm not getting emails or my research uh, reports being sold uh, with regards to iBeacons. Uh, the reason is it's disrupting the ecosystem. Now, I talked earlier about Wi-Fi and its strengths and its weaknesses in terms of signal strength, the network, and latency. With iBeacons, you have a new player on the field. With iBeacons, you have uh, you know, basically proximity-based uh, Bluetooth uh, geofencing, if you will. And they emit the signal. As the mobile phone becomes closer to that signal, uh, it reacts. So you can have something as close as five centimeters, you know, to something as far away as 70 centimeters. I mean, excuse me, meters. Uh, Apple created the iBeacon API in iOS 7 for developers to use to enable these proximity services within applications. Uh, Bluetooth 4.0 is increasingly included in Android phones such as the HTC One, the Samsung Gal Galaxy S3, and upward. And since Android Jelly Bean uh, 4.3, Google has included support for Bluetooth low energy signaling. The industry will support this type of technology. And this is really cool because it doesn't take a lot for you just to buy in with a minimal you know, beacon that's going to be this big or so, and then plug and play, essentially. And then you can uh, make the in-store system specific to, to where you want the range, specific to how you want to greet uh, your, your users, what, what you want to promote in terms of uh, notifications. <coughs> so uh, Apple, of course, deployed this um, at their stores first. And you go into uh, any of the stores, for example, uh, the one in New York, and uh, they put the beacons in various areas throughout the store. And this is an example of what type of application.
application that you would see on your smartphone. So the IV can offerings allow a retailer or brand to introduce you know, hyper-location messaging and interactivity, which is key in engagement. Uh, beacons can be used for entry, exit messaging, checkout notifications, in-aisle promotional targeting. All of this is really starting to personalize the experience for the user. Uh, this is an example of what you know, the notification looks. Um, want to learn more how to use iPhone <coughs> on the iPad? Come back at 3.30 for our next workshop. Another message might be, you know, open the app to learn more about this accessory. So without doing anything, essentially, you know, myself as a user, I can just walk in to an Apple store, and this is the type of, you know, proximity-based Bluetooth uh, messaging that I, be, that I, I would receive. Uh, here is another example, Shopkit, another uh, solution provider in the, in the space. Uh, it's also uh, utilizing this already. And uh, you know, it shows a customer, I guess, shopping for a handbag. And uh, this is the type of notification uh, that, that she gets on her uh, smartphone on her mobile. So this type of engagement is, it, it's new. It's, it's taking the fun, but this is really what's gonna drive sales because she now feels you know a little bit more engaged and she might spend a few more seconds or minutes looking at this handbag and she might buy it versus walking by the handbag being distracted not noticing it you know based on maybe previous purchases she now, you know has that has their attention, their attention. okay so why is this important As an indoor location interaction in the marketplace, uh, Bluetooth 4.0, which I said earlier, is going to completely redefine the user experience for contextual engagement. And contextual engagement are the keywords you want to start hear. You are going to start hearing more of, and that you are going to want to replicate, because this is the type of engagement that's going to drive all verticals in business forward. If my if, if what you're trying to sell me, if, if what I'm trying to achieve as an objective uh, in my daily routine is not personalized, if it's not engaging, like I said earlier, it's, it's not going to mean anything to me. It doesn't matter you know, how fancy or accurate a solution you have, if it's not personalized to me, the demographics show I'm not going to care. Uh, moreover, offering a personalized, relevant, you know, intuitive experience, which I just spoke to, you know, it's going to revolutionize everything from healthcare to retail. Uh, you know, I get a lot of questions from all over the world about, you know, how can I help you know, on a certain project, or can I consult on this, or do I have a couple hours of my time to work on, you know, a conference call or something? And I really get a wide spectrum of queries. So, I mean, I do seriously get, um, you know, requests to work on a complicated database system for hospitals and an ICU unit, for example, to monitor patients better, to, to help uh, doctors track their, their work, essentially their patients better, for nurses to, to be on point with the medications and whatnot, uh, especially when you have high assets, like expensive medical equipment. And then um, also what I've been speaking to all along is the retail piece. A lot of retailers globally are recognizing the value of accurate indoor location. And this is all around the world. We get the same type of questions about um, a retail solution. And it varies. It, it varies on um, how, how big the space is, on um, how accurate they want the solution for your location to be, on what their overall requirements are for the project. So all of, all of these variables play into you know, what the project uh, might cost, how long it might take to deploy a solution, and in particular, what type of indoor solution would be a better match for what type of project. Uh, and lastly, with iBeacons in particular, uh, and, and on the whole where the, the indoor market is going, uh, we're gonna be offering location as a service, essentially. So in addition to you know, the basic <coughs> hardware, if you have beacons or, or anything else that you might have to uh, you know, add to the space, for example, more Wi-Fi units, uh, servers, uh, and integration costs. The service as a whole is going to be is going to be offered and maintained, like I showed you earlier, with revenue generation opportunities. And um, 
I also think it's going to be fragmented uh, because you're going to get solutions that are just plug and play and off the shelf. Uh, but I'm sure that more consolidation will happen. Uh, my recent LinkedIn group, I asked, uh, you know, do you think iBeacons are hype or really happening? Um, you know, you see, you know, 25% of the people basically said, you know, it's, it's not happening, it's just hype. Uh, 40%, uh, 40 people answered, 74% said, yes, it's really happening. And all the data really shows that um, it's really happening. And uh, what we do in indoor, uh, whether it's indoor 3D or indoor you know, location, it, it's it's really making a relevant, tangible difference in our everyday tactile existence. Um, I think that about wraps it up, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. This last slide, there's really not much to speak to. It's, I always try to <coughs> pop on this slide uh, when I give talks because it just shows you know how we react as consumers and users uh, to, to new technology. And you know, a couple years ago. I would say we were more around here, and now I definitely think we're about right here even, uh, in terms of real world applications for our type of work. Any questions? That's about it. Yes. This um, low energy Bluetooth. Yes. Is it going to be normal Bluetooth or is it as in one phone to make it on the You'll have normal Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE. Right. So that's a good question. I think what Apple is doing with regards to that is um, it works with both, but with the Bluetooth LE, it just works more accurately, better, longer lasting uh, in terms of uh, battery drainage. So the reason why I'm asking for battery, obviously, if you turn on there's only one button for Bluetooth, I don't know what is it? Well, that's a good question. What we're finding is uh, that users normally don't turn off their Bluetooth. So, I mean, I don't know what... Oh, it is? Okay, well, uh, the research shows that the average user doesn't turn off their Bluetooth. So, that, I guess to answer your question, it will just depend on... Oh, of course, the new 4.0 will just be low energy. Just yeah, so yeah, and like I said earlier, the issue with the first few generations of Bluetooth is it drains your battery. That's why the low E is revolutionary. Um, but yeah, normally users do not turn off the Bluetooth. Is this only iPhones at the moment, or is it already No, um, I also mentioned um, HTC and Samsung are deploying it as well in, uh, in, their, in their newer phones. So you're, you're going to see the market uptake this technology. Yes. Okay. Yep. So the same devices can be used from Yes, that's how I understand it, yes. But iOS 7 offer an SDK anymore on Android, we already have a decent SDK that comes with it, is it similar to that Um I I would have to check. Um, I usually defer all my technical questions to later because I have to check my research and I have to consult uh, with the guys, the engineers that I work with. But uh, from what I understand, the new standard is specifically for the low energy use case. So it's going to be specific to that. Uh, anything older, I would imagine it would just default to older systems and that's something. So. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Yes. No. No, it's it's all over the world. Um, I can have some general generalizations. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. I only can speak to you know the research I've done personally. Uh, what I find in my everyday work as a consultant is um, usually North America. Uh, Canada and South America, they usually have the same type of questions for me as a consultant. So I would imagine the demographics and information are very similar. You know what they're looking for. They're looking for uh, an accurate indoor solution that's going to be able to leverage whatever hardware or infrastructure that they have. They don't want to spend more on hardware. And they want to know the cost and the timeline for deployment. And usually the same questions are asked in terms of, um, you know, how many users can the system handle? 
uh, what's the latency, um, can I, you know, have specific uh, detailed application built out by your company, you know, we want to make shopping easier or navigation easier indoors. Um, these are the type of questions that I get from those three um, geographic areas. Europe um, also is similar. It's, it's a little different in terms of the kind of information Europe is at, after. I, I get more questions from Europe in terms of security. Actually, I was speaking to that earlier today. Um, and they want to know the same type of things in terms of accuracy and location. But they want to make sure uh, you know, the information is uh, scalable and it's reliable and if it's private, like we were discussing earlier as well. Um, in terms of China, unfortunately, um, I haven't had very much experience in China yet. If anyone wants to help me with that, uh, this, you know, in this conference, that'd be great. Um, but from what I know about China, you know, they're growing leaps and bounds and they have their own, you know, companies and systems that, that work on, on solutions. And I'm sure they probably have something maybe they haven't heard of. Um, that's about it. I guess you might push them to mm -hmm. the Any questions? You mentioned, you mentioned all the time shopping, 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 shopping. Is this the really Yeah, I didn't. I didn't mean to um, drill that into you guys. Honestly, <laughs> um, that's the majority of my work. Uh, it pays my bills, it pays my mortgage. <laughs> so uh, shopping, you know, as consumers in our world that we live in, is the main type of business that I get. I do other things as well. Um, it's just. You know, less than a year ago, I worked on a security project for a huge uh, company that I can't talk about. Um, they deal with like really specific type of individuals, and they wanted a specific type of security. Uh, and they're like the number two company in this business in this vertical. And I also get pings on uh, questions on uh, asset tracking and uh, really making sure that the high value assets are being monitored at all times while in use while not in use being transported, while being stored away in a bay somewhere, huge warehouses, for example. Um, that's, those are interesting projects I get too. Uh, but yeah, the short answer is yes. A lot of the work uh, out in the marketplace is consumer related, um, you know, other than you know, asset tracking and security measures. As a percentage of advertising budget, what do you reckon the mobile market will take? It's growing. I know I said that twice. I couldn't give you a particular number without. It would be growing. It's got a low base. Sorry? It's got a low base. So, as a percentage, what do you see it? 50 50? Um, well, all the trends indicate that traditional advertising is going down and mobile advertising and social media, in particular, micro location in particular, is growing. And I can say that with certainty. You know, if you want a direct number, again, I have to check some things. But um, that's, those are all the indices. That, that's what the market is saying. Uh, and and in, in regards to uh, syncing that up with traditional advertising, you'll find your average like Bank of America or average big corporation, doesn't matter what, very well done. What they're doing is they're just tailoring what they have. They're trying to make it work for mobile, and they're finding it's not working. They're finding that they have to start from scratch, have a mobile team in-house, and really build out uh, their advertising and, and solutions that way. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I think we'll have to stop it now. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.